thank you, Stefan, for the privilege or burden to be the last speaker. Uh, but what I'm going to do to live up to that is I'm actually going to provoke. Uh, I, we have heard this morning uh, from both uh, Tenzin and from Alison Barron about the importance of change, about the motivation uh, for, to find the motivation for change, as Tenzin called it, or to make positive change and create our future, as Alison and Barron said it from Kaiser Permanente. I'm going to do that by looking forward and look for what is better design. I'm going to use two sources of inspiration I'm going to share with you. One is the future fringes, the frontier of design, and analyze those a little bit. And the second is obviously all the learnings that were shared over these two days. These reflections are coming actually from my own current personal uh, quest uh, and are still work in progress. So feel free to disagree. Don't throw tomatoes. Come to talk to me afterwards, but uh, that's okay. I just left my long-term position of global lead of uh, design and experience innovation from McDonald's to actually pursue uh, the new frontiers of design. And um, uh, that's where I'm studying right now and I'm going to share. So. Uh, let's get started. My premise is that design and we designers have been kind of bank baking in the glory of design thinking and human-centered design. We have uh, nothing radical has really happened in our practice since then, and it's probably close to 20 years for human-centered design and close to 10 years for design thinking. I think we have become a little bit stale, a little bit fat and complacent, and have used the glory of design thinking, particularly being picked up by business and the easy money that came with it. I think the good news is that there are emerging design practices that we can use as a way to get us out of that complacency. Uh, the top two are social design and venture capital design, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. Uh, what's very interesting about those two is that they are not coming from the top down. Design thinking, human-centered design came from the big design firms, obviously IDEO. Uh, it came from the big schools. It was really kind of rolled down in a top-down top way. Big business started to pick it up first. These new design ventures are actually starting bottoms up. And there is good in that and bad in that. The good in that is that it's entrepreneurial, it's in line with the times. The bad in that is that we designers who have been working and are really good at the top one are becoming the legacy designers. And we need to creatively distract ourselves. Instead of preaching it, we need to actually do it. So let's deep dive first a little bit into social design. Uh, it's still, uh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, social design is still in the norming and storming phase. It's defined as working in either low development markets or working for NGOs or not-for-profits in developed markets. It's obviously a very close cousin uh, to public design and frankly uh, to service design. And not all social design is service design. There's obviously product design for base of pyramid, but a lot of it uh, is uh, service design. Uh, I've participated in this space for the last two years uh, through my teaching at the IIT Institute of Design in Chicago, where I basically had gotten bored with just teaching the same service design class. And I took the service design class and just took on the social design challenge. And most recently also uh, in my sabbatical uh, teaching in Israel at uh, Bezalel. Um, my, what you see here is all the things happening around social design. Uh, on the left is the uh, Design Observer, which is a very good source if you're looking for information. On the right is all the academic activity. It is unbelievable how many courses and now degrees offered in social design. Uh, and then obviously the, the bottom, an example from all the professional design organizations. Uh, I, first provocation, I think social design is a complete push with very little pull from design and that put from, the, from clients, be that NGO, nonprofits, governments. And I think it's driven legitimately by the next generation of designers, of students who are using Nathan's model, much more meaning and identity driven in what they want to do. And it's also driven by the faculty, so established designers, like many people in here. And it's out of the not wanting to design another IT cup. 
uh, von Egan, certain guilt and, and boredom. However, I don't think that that's good enough because uh, the business model, uh, the practice model doesn't work and I'm going to delve a little bit into it. However, I think what's always helpful with new practices, even if they don't yet really have a sustainable model, is that they do show the way as an extreme situation uh, for new practices. So I would like to use a case study of my own research. Uh, I've just returned from three months in Nairobi. I'm literally on my way back to Chicago. Uh, right after I left McDonald's, I joined this company called Sanergy. It's a social enterprise operating in Nairobi, started by three MIT uh, students uh, three years ago. Actually, interestingly, it was started by four. There are four founders. One of them is a designer, but the designer didn't make it to being an owner, uh, which is a story in itself. Um, the, what the company does is provides uh, hygienic sanitation in informal settlements. Uh, hygienic sanitation is one of the Millennium Goals. It's a huge problem. Over two billion people in the world do not have access to sanitation. It's, that is 50% of people living in lower developed markets. Uh, there is also 1.6 million uh, people, and mostly children, uh, dying every year because of lack of hygiene, which causes diarrhea. Major problem, a problem that has been tried to be solved by many NGOs for many years, but have not been able uh, to break through. So what's different about Sanergy is that obviously the, the functional benefit, using Nathan's model again, is very, very clear. Uh, it is cleaner, it has more hygiene, therefore less illness. But actually, as we know in health in developed markets as well, you can't promote health or create new habits by being functional. It just doesn't rational, it doesn't work. So actually what the breakthroughs of Sanergy is they have figured out the emotional needs and the emotional benefits, and they are actually around human dignity. Uh, well, before you saw the toilets available today on the left, the one on the right are the ones provided by Sanergy. You'll see that they are branded as Fresh Life, again going to emotional benefits. And they build on the insights of what creates that fresh life, that dignity. It's obviously cleanliness, the cleanliness, as you see on the right, is driven by the fact that it's a shared economy solution. The toilets are sold to owner-operators in the informal settlements. They buy the toilets at cost, and they operate the toilets, and they charge five shillings, which is uh, half a cent uh, per use, but they are operating those toilets, so after every use, it actually gets clean. Uh, the second thing you see there, and this is the operator there, you see there is soap and water washing, which is a major uh, uh, benefit from a hygiene and a must. And there is toilet paper being provided, as well as sawdust to put over. over the pieces. So uh, this is actually my, my quality of life picture at the same time. What I found out, uh, rediscovered, I guess, uh, being in Nairobi, is the importance, and by the way, Sanergy calls itself, their mission is, improving quality of life, interestingly. Uh, so um, dignity is actually, we forget about that because we take it as granted. But actually, I'm just thinking out of it a little bit, I think we need to sensitize ourselves to dignity again as well, because dignity is done by respect. And if I'm 20 minutes on a call center line and nobody answers, I actually get irate because of lack of dignity. I don't feel respected. Uh, I think the same way we heard from Fred Leichner on the discussions to have with aging uh, parents or aging people in general, it is, uh, with perhaps some dementia issues, very, very important not to fall into that trap of not keeping the respect and the dignity. So, so to me, it was kind of an additional whole, whole resensitizing to a very basic and important aspect of human life. But back to um, social design now. Um, Social enterprises are the new favorite uh, in the global development industry uh, or sector, and it's really driven by the fact that they believe by bringing market forces, we can solve what has never been solved before, which is both sustainability and scalability of development. The original founder or thinker of social enterprises, which was the founder of the Ashoka movement, uh, Bill Drayton, defined social enterprises winning formula as having two things. One is empathy, which sounds like service design, and the second one is uh, hybrid business models. So one of the things to take away from social design is definitely this uh, radical empathy. The second one on the hybrid uh, business model is that we have to design systems. 
And this goes back to what was shared yesterday uh, by Nikia and Wimalin, which is the idea that we have to design systems. Here is the system from Sanergy. As you can see, it starts with uh, the sanitation facilities. Uh, this one is branded as Fresh Life. It's actually set up as a not-for-profit. So that part of the business, separately incorporated, does not make money. It's a shared economy model, so it's like Airbnb for toilets. Uh, the owner-operators buy the toilets, they run them, and by running them, they outperform the centers that are being provided by NGOs that are run by employees. It's the same charge, it's also five shilling, but they're actually not run by operators, by owners, and therefore they're never really clean. Um, the second model is uh, the waste removal. Um, the waste removal is one of the key aspects of hygiene. Uh, because it's the waste sitting in the communities uh, and seeping into the groundwater that's causing the biggest problem. The way uh, Sanergy resolves that is, first of all, having a patent and unique design, where through what's called the squat plate, these old squatting toilets, the urine and the feces get separated right at origin, has another health benefit of not having bacteria grow, because the, the mixture grows both the bacteria and the smell, so those toilets don't smell. But even more importantly, it makes it much easier, these cartridges, so it's a cartridge model. The company picks up the waste every day, so there's nothing laying around, and, and then takes it away. The uh, separation is also very important from a way, from, for the next phase, and the next phase is the byproduct manufacturing. Again, a branded business. This is the for-profit side called FarmFresh. And basically, it turns it right now into compost, also looking at energy. Uh, and the compost creates the organic fertilizer, which is a dire need in developing markets that mostly have synthetic fertilizer and obviously soil erosion that requires much better fertilizer. So this is an integrated model. Uh, I think this is what uh, you get called the coherent model, coherent system. Uh, I think, as you can see, it is uh, complex, it is multilateral. It probably cannot be designed on a piece of paper. I think it has to be implemented and played with and tried with. And interestingly, the way uh, Sanergy did this is they started from the left to the right. So they didn't develop everything at the same time. They started with the toilets and then moved to the right. Uh, this is how it looks right now, 500 toilets to 20,000 users a day. So talking about scale and sustainability, uh, obviously coming very, very far, very quickly. So back to design practice. Um, so there are values, radical uh, empathy, obviously system design, but it has not reflected into significantly new business lines because mostly for two reasons, lack of funds on the client side, and frankly, much harder to prove the value of human-centered design to NGOs or nonprofits who have social workers, community organizers, who have worked for years in that field, and frankly have been for years living mostly in those markets, and the helicoptering in is not something that sells that easily, and frankly doesn't really work uh, that well either. So the models out of necessity, a lot of individual practitioners, they spend a lot of time traveling, and are getting expertise in different markets. There are uh, design firms, established design firms, but what they have found out is that they have to set it up as not for profit. So they actually approach clients with, we would like to do a project for you, and we have the funding from this foundation to do a project in sanitation. Will you take us? I'm not, I'm not kidding. That is the model. Uh, and then third, uh, in-house groups, uh, which again is probably in line with that complexity of uh, having the design systems. And lastly, um, the only kind of person who tried really hard to make it work in a legacy system was Robert Fabricant, one of the early uh, uh, practitioners of, of uh, social design working for Frog. And the Frog did not, not like IDEO, did not make it a not-for-profit. They might have a little bit reduced rate, but they tried to make it as a business. But he left six months and joined a global and very established global development firm. So it's very similar to what we seem to see in the service design space. It's about access to clients and access to thinking broader about the whole system uh, where design seems to fit in. So, again, social design, things to take away, new practices that might have value for service design, radical empathy, we need to, in the social space, we, can, we need to give up the authorship. Uh, we can't even be facilitators. We need to hand over the tools to the community and to the people on the ground because it's such a different...
context that it's just, it's very, very hard to come in with our bias. Second, design and delivery of integrated systems. And third, multiple business models focused on shared value. Most of, so, most of social enterprises are highly complex, uh, multilateral organizations and, project, uh, and organizations. Let me switch gear completely to um, the, the next one, which is venture capital design. So we're kind of going from one extreme to the other. Um, these are numbers still built. So the best example is we started with Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb, as we heard from Mark, was started by uh, designers. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, let me find my mic. My, my. It was started by artist designers, and the reason it was a good fit was it was based about new behaviors, and it was based on the design to get trust on actually booking a, an apartment through a website. But it's bigger than one, and it's actually a trend. If you look at uh, Jawbone, uh, which is variable devices, uh, Yves Behar is the designer that has been uh, partnering with Jawbone, and he has developed it very early when they were a startup, and he developed a model that was basically equity investment. So instead of getting paid, he has equity investment in it. And uh, lastly is Nest, uh, which was also designer-driven, uh, is the thermostat that uh, is beautiful number one, but number two is connected uh, to your smartphone and you can actually control uh, your heating and air conditioning from in your way as well as get uh, the reports. So um, where do you think all these uh, companies are based? Uh, they're obviously located in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. Furthermore, uh, it is a real trend, the design and venture capital. Uh, John Maida, a former head of MIT Media Lab and president of RISD, just a few months ago joined Kleiner Perkins, one of the leading venture capital firms, as a partner to uh, lead their design council to help uh, designers, uh, uh, to help these startups to have better design. And uh, in the most recent article in the New York Times uh, that talked about this venture capital design move, and about the golden age of design. Um, they quoted the firm to say that they have no kind of Perkins has noticed that more designers are starting companies with the help of engineers versus the other way around. And as Meda said himself, he's quoted, today's design student may be less interested in building a portfolio than in simply crowdfunding an idea. So we see this re real emergence of uh, design entrepreneurship. Uh, this, this uh, article, as I said, look it up. It's called The Golden Age of Design. It was painted three weeks ago. It's really worth reading. It basically summarized the venture capital design as having three main components. The, when, uh, Silicon Valley now looks, has always looked at design as adding value. This has now shifted to actually seeing uh, design as creating value. Designers in the driving seat of startups, engineers being uh, next to them. The second thing is you can't separate anymore style, functionality, and engineering. They all come together. Another thing, another system approach to where design is going. And third, as I already mentioned, the designer-led uh, entrepreneurship. So what these, these two frontiers seem like polar opposites. One is about doing good social impact. The other one is about making as much money as quickly as you can. Uh, and, uh, but I think, like in everything in life, les extremes to touche. I actually think that at their core, they have a lot of in common. Both of them are invading new spaces. They don't ask to be invited in. Uh, they don't come in as facilitators. They go in and prove the value. Both are going very much back to making rather than thinking. Both require integrated multidisciplinary partnerships and ecosystems. Both are bottoms up. As I said, social design is mostly driven by individual practitioners, either in their own studios or in-house, and obviously VCs. And both require sacrifice. These are designers that have chosen not to build their portfolio, as John says, but actually take the plunge and try things. So I believe that if we don't address all these new models of practice, that we are at risk. I think that uh, we are, as I said, we've become the legacy system, and if we don't disrupt, uh, we will disrupt it if we don't adopt. Uh, I believe that we're seeing, we are now being creatively destructed. I think human-centered design 
to a certain extent, creatively destructed the crafts part of design, but I think it's happening again. And I want to end with kind of saying, what do I believe how we need to change for not to be disrupted, for not to be gobbled up, whatever, unless you want to because you like the exit strategy. Uh, and in the same article on the golden age of design, they also quoted uh, Alan Chokinov, who is the, currently the dean of the uh, Pro product of design program at the School of Visual Arts, graduate degree. He's also one of the pioneers of social design, and he's also the founder of Core 77. And he describes that what he sees as design evolving is going from aesthetic, which used to be the craft side, strategic, which was the design thinking and human-centered design, and it's now going to participatory. And I think the term participatory is probably a good summary of what I think how we need to change. And I think it's, it means for us, again, three things. Design making eats design thinking for breakfast or for lunch, meaning we have to, design thinking is not enough. I'm not advocating to move away from design thinking. I think it's not enough. We need to add design making. We need to get and implement more again. I think we need to be focused more on outcomes versus deliverables. I was, the only thing that kind of, I have not been to a design conference in six years, uh, service design. What struck me, the only thing that was kind of a disconnect is that there was a lot, a lot of discussions around how can we prove the value of design. This has been going on for 20 years and design has grown like crazy. We need to stop worrying about proving the value of design by, we just need to deliver outcomes. Then you don't need to prove it. Uh, it's when you have deliverables that are abstract that you have to figure out how to prove it. So I think final call, let's focus on outcomes. Uh, second, um, partners in the trenches. We need to stop believing in our special status. Systems cannot be designed even by creative uh, visionaries and, and outstanding people. It has to be designed in a multidisciplinary way. Uh, the same way uh, complex systems are moving to PPP, public-private people partnerships, I think we should move to DEP, design, DEB, Design, Engineering and Business Partnerships, because that's what's required uh, to build and obviously is also reflected in the acquisitions that we're seeing in the service design space. Uh, I think we should join the ranks of professionals with highly specialized skills. We are not that special. We have highly specialized skills. Uh, lawyers have joined. Lawyers stop wearing suits. They wear ties and they're wearing jeans and shirts. Uh, what can we do to actually really become partners in the trenches? And the third one, I think we need to develop new practice models. This goes back to have having, gone, having grown complacent and fat because our, uh, the model of coming in for two months with six people at 250 to half a million dollars is not going to work exclusively in the future. It will still work for certain projects, certain clients, but I think we need to diversify. We need to look again at other professions on how they do their practices. So let's look at law, who works a lot, has, works a lot of on a retainer model. Uh, let's look at Yves Behar on the equity model. Uh, but particularly in this new space with startups and with social and with more complex systems and multilateral systems, I think we need to look at our model. Um, and lastly, I think in the, the answer might also be in the name service design. It's very interesting to me that the service design discipline, we have chosen the design part of service design to look at our models, our practice models. Perhaps we should explore what are the models on the service side, which tends to be more operations companies and how do consultants in that area actually, what models do they use and see what they apply. And again, the Accenture uh, acquisition of Fjord might, might actually be a good example of that. So I believe you have no choice but to change or be eaten. And I think that participatory means we have to become smart creatives that solve thorny problems. I did not come up with that term. This term just came out of a book that's just published uh, by what made Google's work by Eric Schmidt and John Rosenberg. Uh, so it comes from engineers. And engineers think Google is driven by smart creatives. They define it as being um, outspoken risk takers. That's probably my call is let's become more risk takers. And intellectually versatile. Creative flair, technical depth, and business savvy. That is very similar to the DEB I just talked about, design, engineering, and business. I would like to emphasize the term versatile. We don't have to become business people. 
Business people don't describe themselves as business people. Business people describe themselves as either marketing people, finance people, operations people. Uh, that's another thing. We, we talk about business as if it's a, business is an outcome. It's a, it's a structure. It's a construct. We, we need to be versatile to understand when to call in a marketing person, an operations person, uh, not to be able to do it. And that's what I think is meant by the intellectually versatile. So um, I think the demands are changing and we need to change with them. The Romans already knew that. Uh, the value of design thinking and human-centered design is not going to go away, but I don't think it's sufficient anymore. And I think it's particularly not sufficient for discipline and practitioners like us who have chosen our work because we wanted to be change makers. So make the change so that you can stay to be a change maker. And thank you for letting me provoke you. <laughs>